you so much, Daryl. Um, I just want to ask people to please uh, put the library with which you're associated in the chat so that we can have uh, that uh, to refer to later on. Um, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Claudia Holland, uh, Chief of the Bureau of Library Development with the Division of Library and Information Services. It's great to have you on the call today. We're talking about mobile hotspots. Uh, and although we're focusing on this topic, please keep in mind that these sessions are for you so we can veer off onto any topic that you would like to discuss. Some libraries and library systems purchased hot, uh, mobile hotspots for loan a couple of years ago prior to the pandemic, whereas others have made this decision more recently based on the growing need in their communities, the availability of grant funds to support these purchases, and or increased access to broadband in general, depending on where you live. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little scratchy throat too. Uh, whatever the reason is, uh, we thought it was a good time to talk about purchasing hotspots, particularly in light of the continuation of remote learning options and really the sort of about face um, that the FCC has had in allowing hotspots to be purchased by schools and libraries using temporary congressional funding under the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, whether hotspot uh, purchases will be allowed after this year using E-rate funds remains to be seen. Who knows? Uh, E-rate consultant Emily Hart is on this call in case you have questions to, uh, for her related to these programs. I've invited, there's Emily waving to us. Hey, Emily. Um, I've invited uh, several people from a few libraries throughout Florida to talk about mobile hotspots because really to me, you're going to benefit more from talking to them rather than uh, talking, you know, talking to me because I don't have a hotspot program here. Um, but you guys have successfully, su successfully purchased, developed policies for, and now are circulating these items. So it gives me, and I think um, actually, Daryl, that Cresta is trying to join us. Um, did she contact you by chance? Do you see anyone? And the, uh, no, I'm not seeing anything no. on my end. Anyway, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Michael Naughton from Boynton Beach City Library, Cresta King, if she can get on with us, <laughs> from Okeechobee County Library, and Doug Crane and John Campbell from Palm Beach County library system. And, and they are going to talk to us about their decision-making process, the costs that, of uh, purchasing hotspots, sustainability concerns they might have had, and any other issues that you may need to consider when thinking about starting a hotspot loan program. Please, in the course of this conversation, don't hesitate to jump in with your questions or your experiences. Uh, to share with us. So what I'll do is just sort of start with a few questions um, to get the ball rolling, uh, but whatever direction y'all want to go is fine. Uh, I'd like to first find out, you know, when you all decided to, well, when you first came up with the idea of uh, building a hotspot program. Uh, were you the champion of that process, or did somebody come to you and say, hey, let's think about this? What, what, what happened? What, what was the impetus? Um, we were prompted by TechSoup, and we thought it would be a good idea for students that didn't have internet at home, <clears throat> and it took right off. We, we got, I think, 11 or 12 of them from TechSoup, and we've been running with them ever since, probably our sixth year. Great. I think we've had them about four years. We started with the T-Mobile program um, 
the government program, they provided free devices, uh, and then the friends paid for the monthly data plans. Um, I had seen it in several uh, online newsletters from other libraries, thought it was a wonderful thing to offer to our patrons, whether, you know, going on vacation, going down to the beach, okay, or just, you know, wanting internet because it, it went down in their area or whatever. Um, very popular. Uh, we have recently changed. I had a lot of issues with T-Mobile over the last year and changed from that provider to the TechSoup one that Michael mentioned, probably Mobile Beacon and uh, at a tremendous savings as well. Um, oh, yeah. the original, original one was uh, $30 a month per device and uh, TechSoup is $10 for unlimited plan. So we're very happy with the Mobile Beacon plan and uh, we've actually purchased more so that we can provide more as well as have them for staff when they do outreach programs and services. Awesome. Doug, you have a, and John. Yeah, um, in Palm Beach County, we I believe we started circulating them back in 2018. And that was, you know, we had noticed other systems were starting to do this. Broward County had a program in place, but it was limited only to veterans. So we thought, well, we know there's a lot of our population that doesn't have access to high-speed internet. So we went with the T-Mobile program. Uh, they had actually approached us quite a bit to start this, and we ended up going with them. At first, we had the lower uh, data plans, but then we quickly realized we needed to shift to the unlimited plans. Uh -huh. uh, we, our program, we started with 100 hotspots and it's grown to 200 wow. hotspots. So, wow. And course, over, over how long a period of time? What made you decide, of, you know? Well, the hotspots were in huge demand. Uh, you got to remember our service pop, the population in my service area is probably around a million. Mm -hmm. For the county as a whole, it's 1.5. So there's a lot of, a lot of interest in it just because of the number of members that we have in our library. Mm -hmm. so, so we use that. I mean, the thing to know is that basically T-Mobile gave us the devices for free, but it's always, of course, wow. the trick. They give it to you for free because they know the real profit is in the monthly payments. Mm -hmm. As always mentioned, it's 30 bucks a month for the unlimited. So when you multiply that by 200 hotspots, you know, it is quite a significant monthly charge for them. Uh, but they are continually in high demand. Um, and uh, John is our main person to oversee the day-to-day -day activities of the program and the devices and the connections. So uh, if you want to dive into the topic of how to maintain that, <laughs> uh, I would turn it over to him. Or though, if you have a different question. Uh, oh, go ahead, John, that'd be great. Yeah, John, I'm going to need to just unmute. Can't hear you. Okay. Okay. How about now? Oh, there you go. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, we did start in 1998. Um, yeah. The 20 gig that we had initially, uh, members were easily running up. We loaned them out for three weeks at a time. Um, and yeah, the, the 20 gigs would run up before a single member would be able to use it. So we couldn't, so then we had to like, look to hold off to before circulating it to the next person. Uh, so that just didn't really work for our members. So, uh, we upgraded to the unlimited plan. Um, we, uh, like Doug said, we now have 200 mm -hmm. units, uh, from the initial hundred, I'd say there's probably been about 10% that have been gone for loss or, you know, walk away uh, or, or broken devices that we've had to replace. Uh -huh. um, yeah, um, the program has been very successful just now with increasing to 200 for the very first time we've had uh, a week where not every single device had a hold on it. Wow. So, yeah. And so it's a three week loan period. Is that the same for you, Michael and Lois? And um, I don't know, Crest is not on with us yet, but. Ours is uh, two weeks. Two weeks, okay. 
-hmm. Well, that was right. part of uh, what we did with our system. We standardize everything to three weeks. So before yeah. you, before you got started, did you um, did you get any pushback from administration or county commissioners, anything like that? Anyone, your library board, anything like that? Uh, what were their initial concerns? What were your initial concerns? We we didn't get any pushback or any negative reaction. The the, the county administration and the board of county commissioners liked the program, so we were good. We are also uh, our own dependent tax district, so we were able to budget it for it appropriately and and you know, be able to pay for it. So we were, uh, we, we really just kind of launched it. Everyone was pretty happy with it, especially once we upgraded to the unlimited. So we didn't have the complaints about, you know, getting throttled service. I did drop into the chat, the link to uh, our website for the mobile hotspot information for anyone who'd like to tap on it. Awesome. Yeah, we're an independent library in an unincorporated area. My advisory board and my governing board were both very thrilled with the idea of being kind of like on the cutting edge of technology with these hotspots. Um, and actually, we expanded the collection. And once the pandemic hit, it was wonderful for people to be able to have that, you know, to be able to access our digital resources and such if they did not have internet. Um, and our uh, hotspot data plans are paid for by the friends of the library. So um, we have a, a dozen of them, nowhere near what Doug has. <laughs> but uh, of course, we have a smaller population. Um, and we've really had no problem except for them just getting old and having to be replaced. Um, they are returned on time. And the few that we've had people not return, we simply turned off the data plan. Okay? And then it became worthless. So you know, then it was a little more than a paperweight and we'd get them back. <laughs> so, and there was a block on their library card besides, so they brought it back. But uh, we really have had very few issues as far as having them return. So that in itself is, is a success story, I think. Awesome. So did, so you mentioned, uh, several of you, particularly Doug, mentioned that uh, you got, uh, the uh, devices themselves free, but you paid for the the service itself. What was the initial cost? And then you you decided to go to the unlimited data plan. What was the jump in cost for that? I think it was uh, ten dollars to thirty dollars a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious, Doug. Um, would you consider going to a different? program like the mobile beacon is ten dollars now per device for unlimited which considering the number of devices you have that's a significant yeah. difference in well, price uh well if there's a viable competition that we can jump to i'd certainly be interested in it mm. uh, you know yeah. it the only trouble with with mobile beacon is because it's through tech soup you're limited to the number that you can have in any one year so for us oh. it's fine but for you to replace 200 would would take a long time <laughs> well you know john does the sort of the maintenance on the units and handles mm -hmm. them so uh and i know we've had to do a f we've, we've gone through a few cycles of units haven't we john uh yeah mm -hmm. The majority of units we're still using, uh, we have three different models now because of how they've upgraded over time. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do a similar thing where if the item goes uh, overdue for more than five days, they get deactivated. Yeah. Uh, we don't block members' accounts, though. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, with, once they're deactivated, they usually get returned pretty quick. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the the biggest thing with them is, has just been tracking all the units and you know the the basically balancing our uh, our, our ILS records with the T-Mobile records and I have a spreadsheet that I track everything through. So we track every time we have to deactivate, every time we reactivate, every time we have to replace a part and all that. So do you work on the, the devices the, yourself? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Does, every, does everybody oh, yeah. do that? 
Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, that that in itself, I would think, would be a full-time job, considering you have 200. <laughs> well, we learned that these batteries may not have a long lifespan. Like this one right here, I can feel it's expanding because of heat. It'll have to be replaced soon. <clears throat> I could do it now because I've been smart enough to buy batteries to buy replacement chargers, replacement cables, and the cases that we keep them mm. in. <clears throat> and then the cost of each is in the bib record. So if we don't get the mm. charger back in the cable, we mm. put the bill on the account. If we don't get the whole thing back, here's the bill. So not only just turning it off, mm. uh, get it back, the bill really oh, yeah. back. Mm -hmm. so, and we don't care what condition it comes back. If it's broken, we understand, or, you mm -hmm. know, we understand because we knew going in that this was going to be in homes with children. So mm -hmm. <laughs> things get broken, things get lost. Um, and like I say, here's a perfect example. This was working. It's actually in circulation, but I realized the battery's bad or mm -hmm. will be bad uh, very soon. Mm -hmm. So have to have the spare parts. So can I ask, uh, do you charge for the, the whole device, even if like uh, one part is missing? Because one thing we do is we have it broken no. down to the price for the unit itself, for the power cable, and for the power plug. We, we, we do, do that the, as well. We have the price broken down in the BIP mm -hmm. record, but mm -hmm. we also have the total cost. Yeah. Whichever way it goes mm -hmm. <laughs> is how we proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the only other thing is we change the administrator password on every one of these and make it the same on every unit and we make sure it's not displayed in the window this this model doesn't display the admin password but <clears throat> the subsequent models that john mentioned do so we change so this way we know that the high school tech guys can't change passwords the wi-fi name etc so that's the other suggestion i have instantly change the admin password across across all your units we got a response from uh, sharon witt with volusia county she said that they circulate 375 <laughs> uh, spots wow. it's a competition it's a competition now wow. uh, and yep. she says we've always had a reserve list since we started in 2018. wow wow you know, one thing that changed certainly over the past year, uh, you know, because we were looking at targeting specifically areas that, um, you know, don't have high speed internet, don't have Wi Fi, uh, especially children, et cetera. But one thing that changed over the past year was our school district built out this blanket Wi Fi coverage for school children. Uh huh. But, so, and of course kids all got a device last year so part of what we're wondering in terms of uh, john mentioned that we actually are don't have the whole list as much as we used to anymore is we're kind of wondering if now that every kid has something and they can access school districts or or there's more of these sort of uh, municipal wi-fi blankets out there whether or not people are just tapping into that and they don't necessarily need the hotspot anymore yeah. i mean the hotspot itself uh, I believe you can eight, get eight people connected to it, as I said, unlimited. But, you know, beginning to wonder if maybe there's some more environmental factors changing that. There might not be as much of a demand for the library to provide this. As John, how, how much time a week would you say that you spend on hotspots? Um, I try to keep it fairly limited. I, I give myself uh, like two four hour blocks during a week. So, and usually I, I'm don't even use the, that whole time. So I would say probably about five to seven hours a week. I see. Yeah, so and, I think that's something to consider for any library that wanted to do it is there's there's a fair amount that's required to, you know, to, to keep the program going and active. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, and what, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I just want to, what that breaks down to is a, uh, every Monday I have a list of all of the overdue hotspots. So I go through, I double check the status in the ILS and deactivate them. Um, and then just uh, uh, looking at whatever broken units I have um, and handling different tasks with them. Uh -huh.
So it's pretty pretty straightforward. You've got it down. At this point, yeah. <laughs> it, took, it took a while to develop a system for it. Now, as as this changes, um, I'm assuming as you if you're addressing, you know, the need issue is diminishing. Um, Doug, that would mean perhaps as units break, you wouldn't replace them. I guess is that well, your plan? I mean, at this point, we're just planning on maintaining 200. Mm -hmm. We had thought to potentially expand, but right now we're just going to stay at 200, and then. As we go through the next couple of years, if we find there's not as much interest, we may wind down to a lower number of them. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'd ever get rid of them. Because I think there's a usefulness to them. Uh, but you know, it, it is one of just like any kind of special collection you want to monitor it so long as people are interested in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so did you all only sign with one internet service provider or who did you did you decide to spread the wealth or try other things other pick places I mean we've only used T-Mobile did they give you any kind of discount for 200 oh well, again they gave us the units for free um, but, you know, they're, they're not, to my knowledge, they haven't given us any other kind of discount, but they keep did trying they, to sign us up for other programs that they have, but we've resisted so far. Did they uh, make you sign in blood, like you have to stay with us for two years in order to yada yada? No, no, they didn't do that, uh, to my knowledge. That's so. good. So they gave you gave you two hundred, and there you go, y'all. Think about that. <laughs> talk, talk it up with uh, your local ISP. I have to do. say, um, you know, T-Mobile was fine in the beginning for us, okay. And I think a lot of it has to do with the sales reps that we that you have. Um, but we had a lot of problems in the last year with billing errors. Um, trying to have people return our calls okay, and get the issues resolved. And that was what finally made me just give up and go with the uh, mobile beacon. I was very happy how easy it was to do. And, you know, finally, you know, we paid our last bill to T-Mobile back in June. And I, I was saying farewell because it was a, it was a really bad experience. And like I said, it could just be the sales rep we had was non-communicative and we had issues okay, with, with, with billing errors and such. So, you know, uh, but a goal, of course, also the savings of $20 per device per month is, is significant. So I'm very happy. And we, like I said, we only have a dozen. Uh, and and they're, they're still very well used, of course. You know, you have people that come down to Florida, there's the snowbirds, and they don't want to have to pay for Wi-Fi, okay? So they shop around. They know which libraries in Pinellas County have hotspots, so they kind of like overlap <laughs> from the different libraries so they never have to pay for, you know, Spectrum or any other type of uh, service provider. Oh. Uh, so we've had a question. How do you all administer the data plans? I'm sorry, um, Michael, you're muted. We, we all have unlimited data. Mm. Any one of us that chose a lower data plan, you're going to bump up against it. Yeah. And, and then... You know, it's a sad fact. We like to think people are home doing their homework or watching watching class, but reality is a lot of people are watching movies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We're hit the data or listening to music too. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wish they were taking classes, but again, <laughs> so 20 gigs is not enough in a month. You might as well no. go on with it. So how, yeah. did you, how did you promote your... You know, how did you market this service? I mean, it's been a while for some of you, and for others, it's more recent. So, what? We don't have to advertise it very much. It, we, uh -huh. we, have, we only have 30, and they're all out, except for this uh -huh. one. Mm -hmm. And this is just lucky. And, you know, most of them bump up against the lending period, and they have to return them. Then they go visit Palm Beach County. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I, I do think people flip back and forth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. ours are constantly going and mm -hmm. at, at least for one a week, I have to give some attention to sometimes it's two or three. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, I think we did a little social media or something and, yeah. Maybe a little story on our website when it began, but uh, we don't really advertise it at all. We just have that page that I'd link to that provides information on the program. People know about it. They find it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, we included yeah. it here at Broward. We included it in our press releases and our newsletters, especially when we were close to the public as an alternative if you were missing that access. And I think that was what got the word out the most. Oh, yeah. So how long has Broward had a program, Allison? Several years now. Uh, mm -hmm. It predates me in terms of, and I've been here a little over two years. So um, they've had it for several years. It started for just uh, veterans. It was a very discreet program um, or finite program. Mm -hmm. And then we closed due to the pandemic and we expanded it to everybody. We've purchased more and we're applying for more with the connectivity fund. Yeah, I can say in, in Pasco County, we have 120 hotspots that we're using and we, we don't have much, uh, in, in way of them sitting on shelves at all. Uh, they go pretty quick. We did a social media campaign when we launched it and they flew out the door uh, pretty much as soon as they, as soon as we press send on, on the uh, post, they, they were off the shelf. Um, we've had holds on them. Uh, we have a hundred in circulation. Uh, we use some for outreach hotspots. We're actually in the process of purchasing um, some Insego hotspots uh, to go with our mobile maker space so that we can have a 5G hotspot that's capable of having up to 30 devices um, hooked up to it. Mm. Um, that'll be for programming purposes, obviously, but this is all through T-Mobile. Um, I can tell anyone who is interested in going with a, a 5G hotspot like that, uh, I can tell you they're uh, there is an initial layout cost for the device itself. It's uh, $336 for the device, and then it's $30 a month for the 5G plan, unlimited. Um, so it's the same price. But um, that, that's what we're doing anyways. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. Uh, we had a question. Uh, does Mobile Beacon offer a portal to manage the hotspots? Yes, I answered that in the chat, Claudia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We okay. can get our stats from Mobile Beacon, and you can manage the hotspots remotely. Oh, okay. Can you get mm -hmm. um, Can you get the uh, stats from? I'm sure you can. T-Mobile yeah. as well, and from whomever. Yeah. And do you get those monthly? For it's me? yeah. It's very difficult to get usage stats like as it's going. But we do get, uh, when we get our monthly bill, it gives us all the usage stats for that time period. Mm. So it's it's not a mm -hmm. thing that we can look and see, like, is this device being used right now? But mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And we certainly get the circulation stats from our ILS of how often of they go out and, you know, yeah. how many well, users we've had during the month. So Anna asks, uh, total data transfer as well? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what, what did you all consider to be the riskiest part of offering this program? Getting them back. <laughs> <laughs> At least we thought that, but you know that proved to be a, a falsehood for most for, for most of them. It wasn't really an issue. Mainly because you could ding them. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay. I mean, they could renew them if there were no holds on them, so yeah. they actually could have them for 28 days. So, um, if there's no holds, it's an auto renewal anyway. So, you know, 
-hmm. It usually wasn't a problem, like I said, you know, very, very rarely. The fact that you can disconnect the service makes the device pretty obsolete. Right. But uh, actually, John, maybe you could talk to, um, I know we've, we've had a little bit, especially in the early days, trouble with devices breaking and other things like that. I know there was an issue with, uh, early on especially, with the device that we had. Yeah, the first ones we got were these uh, Alcatel devices, yeah. and they have uh, a double button up on the top here. Mm -hmm. So when we initially got them, uh, we were setting them all with the network name of like PPC library with a password to log in. Um, but people would continuously like, just press in the middle, and doing that would reset the device so that it lost all of the program information. Oh, jeez. So, yeah, so these initial ones were a bit of a problem, and that's what we had our initial hundred of them from. So uh, that's why we modified and we started doing, I don't know if you can see it here, we put the name of the network and the password directly on there, uh -huh. and we just used the default login uh, for the network. So that eliminated that problem, because if they accidentally reset it, they're just resetting it back to what's already there. Um, we do have... A couple members that like you know like Michael mentioned earlier that they could log in and they'll like change the settings on it but again that's just we just factory reset it and it's good to go again so are there particular models that you like better now uh, the newest one we have the the Franklin t9s um, those are really good they have uh, they, they display the network information right on the device they have a usage meter um, but uh, that can be a bit because because it tells you you're hitting a limit even though we don't have we have an unlimited plan. Um, yeah, so they're they're much better devices. They also uh, the reset is inside by the batteries instead of being out on the outside where people can accidentally press it. So they're mm -hmm. they're a lot better. That's good. Yeah, you've gotten confirmation from others, too, that T9s are the best. <laughs> so everybody knows what brand or what uh, model to get now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, I know this is kind of a dumb question because obviously your libraries have, uh, you know, seen some increased use because of your offering this service. But do you think it's increased because of the service, or just it's just an added value uh, for your patrons, and they come in anyway? Hmm. I think in this case, just because for for us being one of the larger systems in the state. It's not a big enough program, I think, that would drive our stats to show a major increase. Mm -hmm. But maybe one of the municipals or smaller systems might see a difference. Anybody else comment on that? We do have certain patrons that come in just for the hotspots. They know that they're available and they'll come in for them. And others, you know, learn about them and then come in for that. But but you know, come in for other things as well. So I think it's kind of a mix. Yeah. I've got to go, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. We appreciate you joining us. Okay. Have a great day. Yeah, I forgot um, one one tip about these. One tip. It's really important. They like to be on window sills in people's houses more than dining room tables. <laughs> they work really well when they're on a window sill. Huh. On the couch between the cushions. <laughs> well, you laugh. Do you have a, do you have a sign? You have got a label on that just that says <laughs> it. You get a strong signal no matter what when you're in when in, the, in within the house. But if it's got line of sight to a cell tower, it works much better. Uh huh. So window sills, I really recommend people put them on the window sill. So. Were there any um, sort of unforeseen costs involved in starting these programs uh, that you know maybe you hadn't thought about or just kind of sprang on you? Uh, I would say for us, the, the big thing is we didn't initially plan to buy 
of the replacement parts, like the the charging cable. Okay. Um, uh-huh. You know, initially I reached out to T-Mobile to say like, hey, can we get these replacement parts? And and they're like, no, we don't have any available, so we had to go to through Amazon, and and so that was, you know, a, a, to have a small stockpile of them, you know, it was a little bit of a, a kind of startup cost. Right. Well, you can buy them in three packs or, or four packs. Like I buy three batteries at a time, three USB cables at a time, uh, three chargers at a time. So I buy them in three packs. Uh-huh. So, but yeah, that it added to the cost that we didn't plan, but it's it's really not a lot of money. The whole unit is a lot of money if, if you had to pay for it. But like that we've mentioned, T-Mobile has been really good. and We got some for you. So we have a great salesperson. So. Ah, oh, yeah. So where do you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Doug. Okay. Um, the, uh, the other thing too, is if you're doing this program, you have to consider how are you sending them out to circulate? You know, cause as Michael, Michael showed off a nice box that we use, we have a pouch that, that my system uses that uh, John is demonstrating. Uh-huh. Uh, well, and what, what are you going to include in there? I think those are some of the startup pieces that, might have to, you have to think about is what are you actually giving them in addition to just the, the device because the device just can't go out by itself because it needs a charger, it needs the cables, it needs all that stuff with it. Mm-hmm. What have we you got? We included a survey form that people could fill out and when it came back we could right. see what they were using it for. So that's a paper form that yep. goes in the, ba- in the bag? Mm-hmm. Paper, yeah. paper survey. Do you, do, uh, do you also, Michael, do you also do a survey after there's, each? Yeah, there's one or two questions on there. Yeah. Yep. How did it work? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You know, but here's the inventory. You know, it doesn't tell them what the costs are. Recharge, bring it back. Say, I don't want to say we copied Doug and John there, but you know we do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we like the box thing a little bit better, but you know what? If we get more of them, the pouch looks like a good idea too. You can see right through, see if you got the four or five pieces back. Um, you know, so, good idea. Yeah, that was one thing uh, with our circulation staff, uh, talking to them to make sure these weren't coming through like the standard book drop, you know, let people know they have to bring them in so that we can confirm it has all of the parts and everything. Uh-huh. Um, you know. Correct. This, this does not get accepted by our RFID written, you know, machine at all. Mm-hmm. Right to circulation. Do you all do that too, Allison? We don't have RFID quite yet. We're working on it. Um, Right now they're in a zippered pouch that's a little more like a fabric pouch. Um, I would not recommend that we do like a clamshell casing or something like that. If people were to put it through um, a, a book drop, that it would result in the puncturing of that and could lead to sharp shards for our staff who are pulling the items out. Um, but on the other hand, it does measurably a better job of protecting the device itself if something heavy were to land on top of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sharon's adding, we have to check the SIM cards to make sure patrons are not switching them out. <laughs> and she said, because some patrons will switch them out to keep the service longer. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. We've had that once. Yeah, really? Boy. Wow. Once. Have there been any any downsides mm-hmm. to having this service? None, none from my point of view. You know, aside from the odd patron issue, like, you know, what Sharon's mentioning with switching SIM cards or, you know, we have uh, a couple members that uh, 
would were basically checking them out on two different cards, like back and forth, so that they could continuously have one. But that's um, not even really an issue, you know, as long as they're going through the whole process just like anyone else. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Any downsides for y'all? Guess not. That's that's always a plus. <laughs> so one thing I guess to share as well is we don't have any filtering on the hotspot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we look like, you know, we filter our our wireless in the library and our, and our PCs, public PCs. But when we looked at this, you know, the idea of trying to use our, our filtering software on the hotspot didn't make sense. T-Mobile offered a filtering kind of thing, but it didn't seem that effective. Mm -hmm. And we felt that, you know, these are being used by someone at their own home. You know, we're not going to worry about it, not going to bother them. Uh, so that actually was sort of one of the things when we were looking at the Emergency Connectivity Act grants that came out. The If you wanted to get hotspots paid for through the program, they did have to be filtered. And so we declined to add to our, uh, add to our collection because we didn't want to mess with the filtering. Uh -huh. It didn't seem like something we wanted to play with. So, anybody else dealt with with filtering? Emily, do you have anything you want to add about filtering? Uh, other than to say that, yeah, Doug is is absolutely right that it is a, a requirement of the uh, emergency connectivity fund that. Um, uh, purchases made with those funds be SIPA compliant, which does require uh, filtering and, and keeping of a security log. Um, so, and I can certainly see why that would be onerous, especially if you have an already existing, uh, fully running, fully functional program the way that Palm Beach County has. Yeah, especially if you get free, free uh, hardware. <laughs> Yeah, and there uh, is a comment from Sharon, um, and and Sharon says uh, that they filter with mostly no issues, uh, and may get some customers that are trying to get to some websites that are filtered. Um, Sharon, can you speak a little bit more to that, and and what your experience has been like? Oh, the real estate sites, interesting. What, what do they use to filter? Do you want to ask? What do they use to filter? What do they use? Is that what you asked, Michael? Yeah, well, what software? Yeah, or does it come with from T-Mobile or where does it come from? Filters from T-Mobile. Okay. T-Mobile. Right. Yeah. Is that the only ISP that uh, only uh, carrier that owns? I mean, that uh, provides. They're does not the uh, only. Become the largest. Yeah. Okay. And we purchase ours through T-Mobile as well. You do? Yeah. Have you had any issues, Allison? No. No. Um, it, sometimes the communication with our uh, rep can be a little spotty. Um, but other than that, uh, with the devices themselves or the filtering, no issues from us. Um, I will say one flip side to this in terms of a drawback is making sure that all of the devices that are floating through, if we're doing a rolling replacement, that the older devices um, match the newer devices in terms of their speed, the data plan connected to them. So that can get a little pricey uh -huh. at times, um, especially if you're looking to start the program. So uh, if we do Get approved through the connectivity fund we're looking for 550 devices so that we can retire wholesale our older devices i see hmm. so does anyone have any comment on how they handle that you just replace them as they 
break or break, <laughs> break mm -hmm. and they can't be fixed. Well, pretty much. I mean, T like, like everyone's been mentioned, T-Mobile has been pretty good about providing them for free, as long as you pay the monthly nut. Uh -huh. They've been pretty nice about it. And like I say, we have to, we do have to keep some spare parts on hand. All three models. So, but so does Verizon not offer this program? I mean, it seems like T-Mobile. I hear you all talking about T-Mobile and and this Beacon. Group, they haven't been but... quite competitive in my mind. Oh, really? So. I mean, uh, the T-Mobile, we got in through T-Mobile. Their right. agent was uh, at an FLA conference and basically was very, I mean, I could say aggressive, but very passionate about yeah. customers. Uh -huh. And, you know, it's funny because we, we, we said, yeah, we want to do it. And, we said, just give us time to move through our process, you know, because as a government, you can't just go, okay, I'm just going to buy it now and be done. And you got to move through the purchasing process, get the invoicing, all that kind of stuff. But it was like our, our sales rep at the beginning was almost annoying because she kept like saying, okay, I mean, we got a deal for you tomorrow. We got a deal for you tomorrow if you sign up tomorrow and, and you get it. And it's like, we can't, literally. <laughs> it's like, I, I can't just sign something and we're signed up tomorrow. We're moving through the process. We're getting there, you know. Yeah. Out, you know, or, you know, I, I it doesn't matter what offer you give me tomorrow unless you're saying that offer is good by the time we're ready to sign. Mm -hmm. It's no good to me, you know. So just chill off, you know. She was uh, making they a haven't condition. been that same way, you know. <laughs> at least I, they haven't been that aggressive recently. So at least not not towards me. Maybe someone else. But, that's um, good. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, so has there been an unexpected benefit? that you just hadn't thought of, or something, a spinoff program as a result of, of your starting. Of course, it's been a while for some of you, so you have a lot more experience than others, but still. Well, um, uh, one, one thing we were able to do in the middle of the pandemic, um, while schools were still trying to figure out, we did get approached by the school district. They had a special division of children who are being homeschooled mm -hmm. um, but these were children from low-income areas with unstable internet access so when we we're actually uh expanding our collection before we kind of let that next set go out we did loan do a little bit of a long-term loan to the to the school district of like 10 that they were able to give to these students to finish the academic year. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to my knowledge, they, they brought them back and then they just went into the regular collection. But um, there, there was that opportunity. So that was kind of nice to help out, you know, the school district. I think the school district figured out what they're doing by now. But <laughs> although I don't know, some days it doesn't look like it. So maybe they're buying their own? It's possible. You know, as I said, they went ahead and they built this kind of cloud um, Wi-Fi across the county for school just for students to connect to huh. and uh, they've and every student got a device so you know it, it, it actually actually changed when uh, one of our branches that's next door to an elementary school when they schools went back into session last year of course attendance was a little limited but this was a building where Typically after school, there'd be this huge rush and every kid would be sitting on one of the public access computers. Well, what they reported back was, you know, the kids weren't using the library computers anymore because they had their own computer. They'd still come in, but they'd sit in the corner, they'd sit at tables, wherever. They're using that and our public access computers weren't really being used as much. So uh, now I don't know how, if the school district is going to go ahead and replace equipment for students as they go along i kind of doubt they will because they got a lot of extra money that came to them through like cares act to pay for that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh so long term i'm not it's not clear to me that these public school students will end up getting a you know a device that they can use so but we'll see. i don't know if that changes with the school district it may change our need to supply these things in the future Right. Um, we've had a couple other little uh, things that have come up. 
uh, like uh, I know one branch they had an issue with a member where they were trying to access something and it was getting they were hitting the filter, so the staff member was able to say, "Hey, let's use the hotspot." So then, you know, then we don't hit that filter. So uh -huh. um, our our bookmobile has um, one of their locations where their normal connection doesn't work. So uh, we also have five hotspots that were from Cephalin, kind of like, I, I don't know where they came from for like special projects. Uh -huh. So uh, we gave one of them to them to use just for that one location so that they don't have that gap in, you know, providing services. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, concerns for this group about that issue that is <laughs> well we're getting close to time and I just want to thank everyone so much for being with us today um, as I mentioned we're going to have the recording up on the uh, BLD YouTube channel um, if you have a topic you would like us to discuss in the future, please let us know. We're always trying to, to address what you all are interested in learning, talking about, you know, sharing frustrations, whatever the case may be. So we'd love to, to have those uh, suggestions. Um, because you're registered, we'll be sending the link to you and you may certainly share that with whomever you would like. Um, and we'll also be sharing a brief survey if you would fill that out and give it back to us, that would be great. Um, we're going to try to continue this registration process. Um, we've had some uh, security sort of issues that are requiring us now to have registration, which in some ways is very helpful and in other ways it's kind of like the very spontaneous um, part of joining us if you can and when you can, but we're trying to make that uh, a possibility as well, even though we do require registration now. Um, we hope to see you again uh, next month. We, we do these every month in case you didn't know, and September 20th will be our next session from three to four. We don't have a topic yet, but it just takes a little bit of nudging from somebody or some idea that just pops up. Uh, so feel free to be in touch. Thank you again so much for joining us and sharing your ideas and your experiences. Very much appreciate it, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay